Okay, um, welcome to the end of the world. This is actually the end of the end of the world, luckily, <laughs> because we began with this series in February. And I only briefly want to say, first of all, thank you to the Comparative Literature Department and Emily After for the support, and especially Michael Ernst, who has been with me since the beginning, supporting me in every step. And also to um, Santiago Spina Celis and Ivan Hoffman, the graduate students are have joined me today for this presentation. And, you, and as you know very well, or some of you know very well in the midst of a strike uh, against the WU administration. So we will begin actually by uh, uh, like allowing Michael to say a few words about the strike. Then we will move to a presentation by Ivan that will introduce um, some concepts present in the work of these uh, th two authors that I also thank you, of course, both of you. Uh, Lina and Mariana for being here. And then at the end, we will have a round of conversations and questions uh, organized and coordinated by Santiago Spina Celis. Okay, so welcome everybody. And I hope you enjoy our last uh, iteration of the series. Please, Michael, if you want to explain a little bit the situation to everybody here. Welcome and thank you all for coming to the final installment of the end of the world thinking from Latin America. My name is Michael Ernst and I am the event coordinator for the Department of Comparative Literature. Today, however, I'm speaking to you unofficially for no compensation because NYU's graduate worker union, GSOC, of which I am a member, has been on strike since Monday, April 26th. After 10 months of contract negotiations, NYU has refused to provide us with a living wage, affordable healthcare, protections for international and immigrant student workers, and support for working parents. In addition, NYU has refused to ensure the safety of marginalized students on campus by continuing to grant the NYPD the power to police students on private campus property. The union entered into mediation with the administration today, which we hope will pressure NYU to make some concessions. But until then, the strike will continue and we need your support. Read our contract demands and share them on social media. Contribute to our strike mutual aid fund, visit our strike hub for more ways to get involved and follow GSOC on Twitter and Instagram to stay informed. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thanks for your, your continued support and for being here today and for your very clear words about the strike. Ivan, please, if you want to continue. And thank you, Michael. And thank you, Mariano. It is with great pleasure that we welcome today Mariana Enriquez and Lina Meruane to discuss the fate of contemporary writing in Latin America. I will say only a very few words by means of introduction to this event and to their work. In his book, The Lettered City, which the title of this event alludes to, Angel Rama proposed that written discourse was a central tool by which the colonial letrados were able to systematically order, conquer, and convert pre-Columbian societies. The Baroque cities of colonial Latin America were founded by these letrados, whose written discourse was inextricably associated to the function of power. Many have argued that the Baroque or classical age of colonial domination is not an age that we have completely left behind. As Mariano Piconsala said, Spanish speaking people have not been yet able to entirely fully evade the Baroque labyrinth. It is with Rama's study in the background that it might be worth asking what writing in the ruins of the lettered city might mean today. I want to propose by way of introducing our speakers a possible point of intersection in their literary sensibility. If the Baroque and of course also the neo-Baroque coast caused a revolution in the ways of seeing, or what Christine Bucci Glucksmann has called a maddening of vision, both Mariana Enriquez and Nina Meruane, writing in the ruins of the lettered city, prompt us to ask, what is the vision of Latin American writing today? The writing suggests that vision today is no longer mad, but that, but that it is rather damaged or hurt. When I say vision, I am referring to the Greek sense of theoria, but in this case, a vision that does not only call for contemplation of what is, but a specific meditation over a world that has been systematically destroyed. Vision in this sense refers to the act of seeing a damaged world, or we could even say that of seeing a damaged life to evoke uh, Adorno's minima moralia. Writing in the ruins of the lettered city provides us with a vision that has been damaged by staring at a world in ruins, decomposed by the daily, daily horrors of its present. By talking about a damaged vision, I am invoking, of course, Meruane's Sangre en el Ojo, translated as seeing red, 
a chilling narrative of the loss of vision, blindness, and darkness caused by a strange disease. But I'm also invoking Maurice Blanchot's imperative in the writing of the disaster that we ought to, I quote, learn to think with pain, end quote, end quote. This is precisely what the tragedy of history forces Adorno to do. He says, and I quote, the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass, end quote. Pain gives Meruane a particular perspective on the world, a splinter that becomes a prison. In the horror stories of Enriquez, not only are the uncommon, strange, and the ominous pervasive, but obscurity or the darkness which impedes vision is also thematized. To give only one example, in Ese Verano Oscuras, the conditions of a world in ruins are expressed by electricity cuts, which force two friends to read a book about serial killers during a summer of total darkness, which they call their end of the world. And I quote, los nombres de nuestro fin del mundo eran crisis energética, hiperinflación, bicicleta financiera, obediencia de vida, peste rosa. Era 1989 y no había futuro, end quote. Joyce wrote, Joyce wrote that history is a nightmare from which we are trying to awake. Not only history, we have to say, but the present is such a nightmare. Much of Latin American literature is an attempt to see through the horrors of such a nightmare. Not only does it attempt to awake from it by negating social realities in its utopian dimensions, but also to portray it, to disclose its horrors and abominations. It is in this sense that Meruane and Enriquez provides us with the paradigm, perhaps, of a hurt or damaged vision. Mariana Enriquez was born in Buenos Aires, is one of the most intriguing narrators in contemporary Latin American literature. Her novels include Bajar es lo peor, Como desaparecer completamente, and Nuestra parte de noche. Her story collections include Los peligros de fumar en la cama, also a collection of chronicles on cemeteries she has visited around the world, Alguien camina sobre tu tumba, and Las cosas que perdimos en el fuego. Nina Meruane is an award-winning Chilean writer and scholar. She has published two collections of short stories and five novels. Translated into English are her latest Seeing Red and Nervous System. She has written several non-fiction non books, among which is her essay on the impact and representation of the AIDS epidemic in Latin American literature by Al Bojaj. She currently teaches global culture and creative writing at NYU. Please join us in welcoming Mariana Enriquez and Nina Meruane. The word is soldiers. Okay. <clears throat> I guess I start. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Mariano. Thanks, everybody that it's, uh, you know, on the other side of the screen uh, and helping things in the background. And thank you, Lina, for being here with me. And I'm always, always glad to share a space with you. Uh, a screen or a table or whatever. <laughs> um, so um, I don't think I can be as, you know, I don't have uh, such a good vocabulary as Ivan or, or I can be that articulate. But I think I can, um, through uh, my years in writing and in the, in Argentinian and the for Latin American literature uh, through the journey I've been through, I can maybe uh, give some hints of how inextricable politics, uh, the, at least in my country, absolutely pessimistic and in a way, nihilistic way of seeing politics, I think is something that is going on in Chile too at the moment. And uh, that it can be exhilarating in a way, but also very tense and very uh, difficult, like the anti-political thing in Argentina at least is brewing some kind of uh, uh, disaffection that is very, right wing this not, and not other way to put it um but also how economic crisis that is very kind of permanent at least in in argentina uh helped in a way literature what you could think well that's kind of weird or paradoxical but it has some kind of uh explanation I started publishing in the in the middle 90s. 
The middle 90s in Argentina were um, politically and economically a very strange uh, time. Even mentioned before a uh, short story I wrote, it was about, it was set in the late 80s. The late 80s was a time of uh, hyperinflation, absolute uh, political crisis. The president had to, uh, you know, uh, make the elections earlier because he didn't have any more political power. Everything was a disaster. We had changed currency even. The currency even had a different name, etc. So came another president that had a very strong relationship with America specifically. And uh, changed the cultural landscape a lot too. And there was, a, by, by doing something that is kind of complicated to explain, but at the same time, I have to, you know, take my word for it. Uh, for every peso, that's our money. In our central bank, we had a dollar. So this meant that basically our economy was dollarized, but not really. So uh, basically to, to maintain this very, very difficult equilibrium, what you had to do was cut waste everywhere. And that meant jobs and that meant social help. And that meant, you know, so there were lots of people that were making a lot of money and lots of people, including my family, that basically lost a lot and couldn't really work, et cetera. But for, for many people, that time is perceived as, as a time of like a neoliberal mini paradise that happened in the 90s. I published, doesn't matter how it's long, but I published, let's say by chance when I was 20, my first novel in this climate, there was, as I said, part euphoria, part tragedy. Sometimes in the same neighborhood, it was very intense time. And uh, my novel was a novel that spoke about uh, young people, about young people living in the night. You could see the this, uh, openness, especially to American uh, literature that happened in those days because of the influences that were in that novel. I, like I was reading, I don't know, British Tonellis, Hubert Selby Jr., Kathy Aker. These were my heroes those days. And um, even movies like uh, early Gus Van Sant and stuff like that. And uh, when I came to to, to the literary ecosystem in my country those days, there were basically no women or very little women, or the women were older. They were not certainly not women my age. And there were not independent presses. Um, through the years and as the very big economic crisis of 2001 happened, that crisis had to do with that economic uh, system we had exploding in the air and basically leaving the country in a disaster, disastrous, really a disaster state. Three things happened. The first one was first that the, it was a very clear eruption after that disaster, that, uh, that disaster meant people fighting in the streets, the government killing the people that were fighting in the streets. Uh, basic, we didn't have money, like we didn't have money in the sense that we didn't have money, literally, we, we, like you couldn't take money from the bank. There was no money, people were absolutely insane in the streets, hitting banks with pots and stuff, asking for money. There was no more money, basically it was all uh, the, the the money was used to pay debt and stuff like that. And um, many people resorted to exchange things. 
I remember clearly I worked as a journalist and I remember clearly going to these places where people were exchanging things like a book for uh, trousers and things like that. This lasted about two years. Strangely, in those two years, uh, these three, three things happened that are very uh, political things in a way. First, uh, facing the complete impossibility of publishing in a big publishing group because of this situation, many little presses started, many. And they're still alive to this day, most of them. The pandemic will, will be, been tough on them, but they're still releasing books. And uh, I think up to this point, they have their own book fair, their own thing. And I think up to this point, those independent uh, publishing houses, let's call them, that started from the economic disaster are up to, I don't know, but maybe a hundred or something. It's a very strong movement. Um, the, this movement allowed many things, but the two or three most important things that this movement allowed was uh, that many women started publishing. That wasn't the case before, probably I think, because there was still the prejudice that the market didn't want women, that people didn't want to read women. And these uh, small presses like made, you know, uh, the step to say, yeah, women now. And um, what happened also was that politically a group of artists, not only writers, but uh, for me, especially writers, that were sons of disappeared. I mean, this, I mean, with this uh, sons and daughters of the, the people that were killed during the dictatorship in the 70s, started publishing fiction, memoirs, making movies, and talking about their experience in totally unexpected ways, and in many ways, uh, using a discourse that was not the discourse of the human rights uh, uh, groups. And we're not against them, I don't mean that, but they weren't using that kind of language. They were telling their stories as the new generation and the new generation that was also not only now traumatized, but that event of the dictatorship, but also of the most cruel or one of the most cruel of the the consequences of the dictatorship that was this infinite uh, economic crisis. The fact that these young writers and artists took the word and you know gave their stories their own way of telling. For me, for example, as a writer, was very important. And I think even if they don't um realize i think in a way but they opened for writers of their same generation that were not you know direct victims of the, the dictatorship some kind of uh, very healthy um disrespect about some themes and therefore i could for example use the economic crisis to write a horror story and mainly write, you know, dark and fantastic and horror, basically. Um, to use uh, the dictatorship as a, as a metaphor of evil uh, and to recreate all that raised us. I don't know, we were all children of us, you know, most of the world in a way. But we are all children of Spielberg and Star Wars and Stephen King. And uh, instead of, you know, feeling that that wasn't part of our culture, we grabbed that and we did with that um, our own reinterpretation of that. So that, it, that something happened 
in our literature, especially in the literature of women, me, Samantha Schwebling, et cetera, there's many, that we started to write basically gender. And, uh, and this is because I'm not, you know, scared anymore of, I don't know if scared is the word, but um, I'm, I don't have any prejudice anymore to apply gender to uh, sociological themes. Uh, this opens a whole new landscape, I think, in, in, our, in, in our literature. And strangely, I um, started finding coincidences in um, writers from other countries. I don't know, Liliana Colanzi from Bolivia, for example, that is a, is a writer that um, mixes also politics and then folklore, she's from Bolivia and uh, science fiction. Uh, writers from Chile, for example, like Nona Fernandez that work with the dictatorship in a very unexpected way too, uh, etc. I don't want to, you know, uh, bore you with many examples. But what happened in the streets, I think, in 2001, and the, the, that, that disaster bred a, a literature that deals with the fantastic, that deals with imagination, but in no way like the literature that dealt with that in the 50s and the 60s in Latin America that, was, that had a lot of vitality, that had a lot of optimism, that had a lot of, to me, notion of a new world. I think this literature now is darker. And uh, when, you're, when we were talking before, or Ivan was talking and mentioning like the end of the world, sometimes they call us the end of the world and Argentina, Chile and Uruguay because we are literally like near Antarctica. But it has that, I, I wouldn't say apocalyptic because it's not that. But yes, a bit of a, uh, I, you know, hopeless kind of vibe. And um, at the same time, this hopeless kind of vibe of the content of, of the themes and etc. of the literature comes with a very, very, very strong uh, sense of. Uh, togetherness and production and uh, a vitality in that kind in publishing and in talking to each other and sharing uh, contemporary literature between each other that at least for me that have been in the scene, let's say since 1995, uh, it's a first and it's been a first for a few years and I feel even in these circumstances that we're dealing now that are not very nice, I feel very lucky to right now in this, uh, in this climate and with the writers that are my contemporaries and my colleagues. And that's why I can tell you, then we can talk more with, uh, with the questions and, and stuff. Now my turn. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me. Let me change the viewer uh, position so I can see everybody. So thank you very much, Mariano uh, and the Department of Comparative Literature. And of course, Michael, uh, Santiago and Ivan. Uh, thank you for those lovely words of introduction. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here with my friend Mariana. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear her speak and share uh, events with her lately. Uh, we've had a few, so that has been uh, fantastic. I will return to some of the things that Mariana described because there are some connections and parallels to the situation in Chile in the recent years, maybe the last 10 years. Uh, in sort of the changes in the political and cultural field and uh, the role played by the, the writers, right? And the, and the 
what Angel Rama called uh, the letrados. Um, but I'd like to actually first turn to him, uh, briefly mentioned by Ivan, um, because his uh, foundational concept uh, gives title to the Zoom, but also because it brings up a question that I found particularly interesting, this notion of the ruins of the lettered city. Um, and I was thinking while trying to produce something to say here is, uh, is it really that we're we're still in this fight to access the lettered city in terms of value of, of some power that we want to acquire as writers, or is it that we want to destroy the lettered city, right? Uh, and I'm using a very, you know, a very big uh, we, of course, this is uh, each of us. But this is sort of the, one of the central notions uh, the lettered city of the study of Latin America, um, and it takes from the colonial period till today, right? And as a foundational concept, uh, it places, some of you may know, some of you may not, uh, intellectuals, right? Uh, as sort of, it, it sort of connects intellectuals with political leaders. Uh, they used to be like that in the past, not anymore, but, um, so I was interested in this idea, and I wanted to also say that that world of the intellectuals who were also political leaders, who were also economic, the economic elite of Latin American countries, were mostly masculine, a masculine elite, right, who wrote the law, because etymologically, letra and law come from the same uh, word. So they were all men, right? They wrote the law, they wrote the principles that would rule us. Um, and that would of course go hand in hand with the expansion of publishing um, and uh, the sort of expansion of newspapers, letters, novels, and poetry. But still it was mostly men who dominated the literary and the political and the economic field. And there were actually, just going back to the 19th century, there were always women, but there was only one woman, woman per country, right? There was always this muse, this selected woman from the, usually from the elite as well, right? Who had been granted the possibility of being the only writer. So it's mostly one amazing figure in, the, in that period, right? Um, but, the important thing is to remember, I think, that literature uh, became not only the law, but also literature became uh, the instrument of power and control and the form of hegemony. And that um, the notion, the, liter the literary production was connected to power and the economy by promoting one narrative uh, that would be imposed to the citizens and subaltern subjects of the nation, right? And, um, and so I think that it's important to remember that literature wasn't what we know as of today. It was mostly um, uh, uh, relating to power and confirming the principles of power, right? And also making sure that those in the elite would be distinguished from those who were not in the elite. And it was the letter, the writing that distinguished those groups, right? And so I thought that it was interesting and Rama was very interested in, interested in the notion of ownership and administration and the technology of the letter in terms of power and how literature would eventually ensure the endurance of those in power. So that's the 19th century, and I would say very much until the late 20th century, which is the time when we grew up, uh, Mariana and I and my generation, and of course, uh, many others, right? Where, where we recognize that there is a discursive practice that can include and can exclude. And this is sort of the point of my question, right? Are we going to accept? Or do we want to access the letter power? Or do we want to destroy the letter power? Who is going to decide that? So that brings me to my sort of my, my question, right? And Mariana, when, when Mariana noted 
uh, the sort of the growth of the publishing industry that came from a crisis, a political and economic crisis. And she mentioned the, the multiplication and the fragmentation of the publishing world. That also happened a little bit later in Chile, right? But it actually allows the literary field to dispute, the new independent literary field to dispute uh, the what now is called in the neoliberal world we live in, the market share, right? And the cultural hegemony of mostly internationally controlled presses. And I think that one of the things that happened, and I think Mariana uh, skipped to mention this, is that because Argentina actually controlled its economy and sort of said, we're not going to be taking more imported books. This is when also the, 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 the independent uh, publishing industry uh, was uh, strengthened. This is not the same situation in Chile, but still the independent presses strengthened and also opened up its space to newer voices, sort of emergent uh, authors, uh, a multiplicity of women, right? But also people that historically did not have were not letrados and were not part of the elite. And I'm thinking of, for example, Washington Cucurto, to just give an example, who would maybe, maybe be considered or who would place himself as a racial other uh, from the white dominant masculine uh, literary world. Or queer authors who were also not necessarily allowed to share the space with previous authors. So I think that this is a, the moment when in Argentina and also Chile, right, there's a lot of emergent voices because there is space for them to voice their, their, um, their discontent. That's the word I'm looking for. So, so when I'm thinking of these sort of this question, acceptance or, um, or perhaps destruction of the lettered city as it was, right? I actually came up with the idea that it is sort of the destruction of the hegemony of the, of the lettered city. Um, as new, newer writers, women, queer, uh, non-white, uh, as they access uh, the, the letrado world, meaning they want the access and that access, accessing the letrado world is actually what destroys that uh, normative and unique narrative of the people in power. And I want to say that that has diversified the literary production in such a way that I personally, and this is going to sound very um, self-interested, but I do think that the narratives that are being produced in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Peru, Paraguay, Mexico, are so diverse that we can't speak of a generation anymore. We can't speak of one narrative. We are speaking of multiple narratives that both confirm and contest uh, power, right? In many different and interesting and very creative ways. Let me switch now to Chile, the very recent events. I think this is also a demonstration of how things are shifting very quickly because of the economic, political, and social crises that is occurring uh, down south at the end of the world, as Mariana uh, was rightly saying. So in October 19, uh, sorry, in October 2019, right, there was what we called the estallido social, or what is also maybe in English called the Chilean revolt. Right, It was due to economic pressure. It was due to the fact that although the language of neoliberalism and the promise of the governments that followed the dictatorship promised everybody would be rich by now, basically, that didn't happen. And actually the, the inequality between those who are lower down and those who are high up has um, grown. Um, so that's one thing. Public education is very bad. Uh, private education is very expensive. The violence against women has exploded, right? Everything seems to be going wrong and that has to do with the crisis of neoliberalism. So at one point, and I won't go into the details because it would be very long, right? People came and took the streets. And I think that that's something that was very, very new for us because although we had had many strikes and protests on smaller questions, health, 
education, pensions, et cetera, et cetera, we suddenly, Chileans suddenly realized that all of these things were connected and that they had to do with those who were in power um, growing richer and richer, right, and not distributing uh, fairly. And what happened, and I'm coming back to the question of the lettered city, it is that Santiago became uh, quite literally a lettered city because the people wrote on the sidewalks, on the walls, on the doors, everywhere. So suddenly, for example, Santiago was filled with graffiti where there was no I, but a collective subject speaking simultaneously with all their angers and discontent, right? And I really thought at that time, this is what the lettered city actually is becoming, right? There's no voice of power because, or there is, but it's being contested by all these words that are multiplying uh, on the streets. Um, and I thought, where are the, where are the writers today, right? What, where is, where are the institutions of writing? Where are the universities, the schools, the media? And it turned out that university schools and media were still on the side of power, mostly, right? And it was the people who were contesting that power, sometimes with a kind of language and a sort of a playfulness and, you know, with a creativity that felt like much more interesting and important than literature itself. Because I thought the literary expression, a novel, for example, takes longer to be written. Uh, the mediation in time is slower. I myself wrote about the estallido social, the Chilean revolt, but it took me a year to put together a book where I could actually think about uh, the violence that had occurred there, the, the blinding uh, of the citizenry by the militarized police, right? So literature is sort of a slower process, but the lettered city actually came again, uh, literally to, uh, to, 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 to be shown uh, in the city. And I, I'm, I'm finishing now with a couple more things that I want to say about literature and the law, la letra, because one of the big um, decisions that the people took and one of their main aims was to uh, destroy the constitution that was, uh, that was written and passed under dictatorship in 1980. So the climax of the, the popular revolt in Chile was to ask for that constitution to be put down and a new constitution to be written. And very strikingly, the referendum that asked the citizenry whether they wanted a new constitution or not, won by 80%, almost 80%. So the dictatorial constitution and its principles, right, are now being well, soon will be hopefully rewritten, right? Sort of run down and written again, but not by those in power, not by those in Congress, hopefully, but the popular will uh, asked for uh, that constitution, the law, right? To be written by regular citizens that would be voted for. That's a very, very complex process and I won't go there. But I do want to say that without trying to uh, fetishize the people and their writing, I do want to think that there is something that the people are going to be writing that has to do with the, with the contestation of the lettered city as it was, right, as it was defined by Angel Rama, and that literature seems to be following uh, behind uh, for a while. Um, and that I think is uh, very, very interesting. So with that, I will finish. Thank you very much, Mariana and Lina. Um, first of all, I was I just want to say that I'm very happy to be here, as I have been a long time admirer of your work, both of your work, Mariana and Lina. And I also want to remind the participants that you can uh, send questions via the chat so that we can, by the end, after a series of questions that I'm going to make, like we can discuss everything. And I want to start. Uh, and I, might, I want to do my first, my first question about a quality that is shared by your works. And, and that, that is the quality, in my opinion, of probing the reader on a deep level. 
right? So I am speaking about your use of horror and the unsettling, whether by describing with piercing intimacy the nature of disease and sometimes predatory behaviors of the sick, in, in, in your case, Lina, or by, by narrating with excruciating attention, gory or horror-like things like killings, disappearances, torture, physical suffering, in your case, Mariana. And I wonder if you could talk about why you're interested in this visceral, raw and disquieting registers, right? In which in many ways challenge a romanticized representation of Latin America. And I also wonder if you could talk about why or why not fiction has, and this is taken from one of your essays, Mar Mariana, the duty to provide discomfort. And what does discomfort can do or open up in aesthetic terms? I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I think you must decide. No. <laughs> Maybe Mariana, since you just talked, you must be. Yes, yes, good idea. Mariana, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Sorry, I was, uh, I have a church next door. I was like banging the bells like crazy. <laughs> so I had to really, and uh, I don't know, I don't think it's allowed, you know, because of the pandemic, I should call the police. Um, anyway, why do I choose that? You know, I think first, and this is very, um, the most honest answer I can give you because I like it. Like I grew up reading genre and I always wanted to do it and, um, also, there was kind of a, to me, there was kind of a, when, when Lina was uh, talking about this guard, this guard of the little city by the men, there was something very clear there. There was the, this minor, and after, even with the uh, Argentinian fathers of literature, like Borges and stuff, those are like exceptions. Like he could write the fantastic, but you couldn't touch Borges. Like, you, you, I mean, I was, for me, it was eye-opening, for example, to see like comic books, like The Sandman by Neil Gaiman. I'm talking like really pop culture here. That he was grabbing, you know, Borges, Chesterton and everything and putting it there and using a very popular medium. And to me, it was uh, very stimulating, but also was very, surprising and some and somehow like uh, I wanted to do that you know taking off the the lettered city let's say because no one would hear no one would use those basically men to do an operation like that you know uh, uh, and uh, and also um Borges, even when he was uh, interested in the fantastic and stuff, he was not at all interested in the local fantastic. I mean, he would never write about, for example, local mythology of, you know, original peoples from Latin America. He would write a long uh, book about uh, Icelandic Edas. And... Um, this is something that also happened with a, a very famous writer of the of the genre like Horacio Quiroga. He's uh, originally from Uruguay, but lived all his life in, in or most of his life in Argentina and lived a lot up north in the you know in the in the in the border with Paraguay and Brazil, Misiones. That is a very basically is the jungle, is it's jungle all well, not now, but back in the day when he lived, it was almost all of it was jungle and very little cities. And there, the mythology there of, you know, the indigenous people there, the Guarani, as there were this many, and, uh, you know, Afro-Brazilian religions, and also it's a place that is bilingual. You speak Guarani and you speak Spanish and also trilingual, maybe you can speak Portuguese too. We call it Portuñol, a mixture of uh, Portuguese and, and, and Espanol, and he never used it. He never used the linguistic possibilities. He never used the mythology of the region. He never used anything that was local. He all he wrote the stories 
in the style of Edgar Allan Poe and, uh, and Jack London, maybe, you know, those were his, his writers. And um, to subvert that a bit, you know, to use genre the way that I understood it with my influences, with the, the influences uh, of the beliefs that were in my, you know, everyday life, in my culture. To me, it was, even when I didn't think like that, when I started writing, maybe, but it was very subversive because it wasn't done by not, it was not original that I was doing it because it wasn't done because of pure prejudice. It was superstition of women, superstition of brown people, you know, and it was like absolutely in a way put aside because of that, that could not enter literature. Literature was the reign of other kind of people and even token women, <laughs> like uh, Lina was, was saying, there was, I don't know, Victoria Campo, Silvino Campo, super upper class women, like an, an upper class that you wouldn't believe. The, the women that didn't even go to school, women that their first language was French, they had to, taught themselves Spanish to, to write, that went on vacation to Europe with their own cows in the, in the, in the uh, you know, in the boat, because they didn't trust the cows in Europe. This was, this is the kind of, it was not rich people. It was again, another kind of dimension. And these were the lettered women that were allowed to write. Uh, almost extraterrestrial <laughs> women. Mm. So that was one thing, you know, trying to incorporate something that was not allowed in a way. And that was allowed in, um, and it was because of this that Lina said very clearly, that was this um, opening of the field that let, you know, uh, brown people, uh, queers and their sensibilities too. Because, you know, there's a very, very famous uh, writer that is gay in Latin America, in, in Argentina, literally to this Manuel Puig, that is internationally famous. But Manuel Puig didn't have like a school of writing. He was like a weirdo in a way. And he actually died uh, outside of Argentina because he was never quite accepted in this, you know, everybody knew that he was talented, he was brilliant. And but, but which were his materials? His materials what he were hearsay, conversations of his aunties, melodrama, the movies he saw with his mama, psychoanalysis. I mean, a lot of spoken word and a lot of of you know uh, a word that was not a prestigious word. There was a, a word that was. Um, uh not considered to be literary word and uh, that changed so um that's in terms of the of, of of you know the literary reasons that i understood later the the the, the first thing that uh, you know the first uh, movement was i want to do this because i like this and then to me using Genre, or you know, being uh, attracted to, to to violence, to the darkness, to the you know the suffering of the body, etc. Um, or oh, it's very similar to reality in a way. I think it's only sometimes, of course, in my writing is grabbing reality and you know pumping up the vol the volume of reality. It's just, you know, it, instead of being in eight, it's in my stories is in 12. But sometimes even I use situations that are situations from reality and people read in fiction and don't recognize them because they have forgotten it in the kind of overwhelming violence that goes here every, every, every day. And this speaking from Argentina, that is not the country that suffers the most violence in, in Latin America. So um, there's more reasons, but I think those are the two reasons that to me is a more mimetic genre than 
you know, than other mimetic, the other genres that, you know, try to mimic reality. I mean, horror, it's, it's a language that we all know. And also using this kind of uh, discarded things was something that was very attractive, att attractive to me and that I found the space culturally and politically, I found the space to use them and not to be discarded, at least now. At the beginning, it was a bit uh, harder, not much. They didn't have like, a, you know, I, they, I don't think I ever had a hard time or anything. Uh, but I think I had, when I was younger, I had more of a hard time because I was a young woman than because what I was writing, nobody really cared about what I was writing. They just wanted to know why I wrote about drugs and I, you know, if I was doing drugs and that's why I was writing about it. But that's, it's completely different. But that's why I think it could go on, but that's why I think. And also because I was raised in the dictatorship. So I was raised in horror, in literally horror. And, uh, and that horror didn't last only the years of the dictatorship, they are absolutely almost coincidental with my childhood. That's very, you know, as a formative period go, must be like the strongest kind of trauma you can. My house was not a house of activists, but it was a house of people that knew what was going on. So there was this thing that everything that was talked about in the house about politics you couldn't say outside so it was living in constant fear of a word sleeping and people knowing that they could come after me or my family and then when that ended in Argentina there was an explosion we call it el destape like it's the you know the, the coming out of things and all, all the ugly things horrendous things the torture the you know the clandestine centers of detention the the people that were thrown from planes to the river, et cetera. That was all over the media, all over, like all over it. Like it was, you know, um, a royal marriage. It was absolutely amazing. Every magazine, um, every human rights investigation, every TV show, everything was that. People were all the time talking about that. And as a girl of 10 or 11, I had no, uh, my parents didn't put any boundary there. They let me read everything. So I sometimes I say it's not true, but I think the first horror literature I read was that, was an interview to a torturer that was like explaining what he did to the prisoners. And I didn't understand half of the words. So I went to the dictionary and looked for torture. What, what is torture? And, you know, learning that way. So these are, it's kind of a mix and it's not very, you know, uh, organized what I'm saying, but these are many of the reasons why I choose the themes and the, the uh, the the style by which I approach them. So, Mariana, thank you because I think that um, um, I mean we we share the story of dictatorship, and I think that I'm going to start with what Mariana said. Um, the difference was that I didn't hear the story of dictatorship until it ended. Basically, not not so much like that. But my family was a what was called comfortably apolitical, right? Mm. Which, you know, exactly, we, we know that what that means. So, uh, but what that meant is that uh, when I started my university years and we had our letape, right? Our coming out of the horror, I was horrified, right? To learn uh, also what torture meant and horrified to understand that medicine, which was the practice of both my parents uh, could uh, save people but also doctors could be torturers, not, not the case of my family, thank God, right? But this sort of horror story of the bodies uh, that had disappeared, been tortured uh, in, in, in um, sinister ways, really, right? It's not just because torture has its own perversity. It's not killing people. It's, it's the pleasure of making somebody suffer as well, 
right, in, in the most horrific ways. So for me, this was a, an eye opener, right? The, the fact that um, even doctors were trained as torturers or would keep people alive <clears throat> so that they would sort of uh, tolerate more torture and then perhaps say what the torturer wanted, right? So I think we, we, do, we do share that. But I also think that what happened to me is I, I was always very interested in, in body issues. And body issues, because of my own personal history and my being brought up by doctors who always spoke of bodies, right? And the horrors that bodies suffered even when they were not tortured. So I think that's really sort of uh, is something that formed me in, in my language and the way I look at things. And so I'm never scared um, or very little scared of the visceral. I don't feel I'm being visceral when I describe what happens to bodies sort of with a zooming in, so to speak, which is what people uh, often tell me that they're horrified by reading my description of body parts because I zoom in. Um, but, at, but at the same time, one of my questions and your question, Santiago was also on the aesthetics, right? And one of the things that I sort of think a lot about is how do you describe horrific or visceral things? Um, sort of escaping from the kind of realism that the TV shows or that reality TV shows, right? The sort of the, the kind of sensationalist uh, take on the body. How do you do that in writing? I mean, at least I was interested and how do you find sort of the poetry uh, in even in the horror of the bodies? And so I think that that's, that's where my, my work has been put in trying to talk about the visceral, but without making it sensational, without making it sort of gore or spectacular in the way that sometimes power wants uh, to, to intimidate people. And let me give you another example. I mean, I wrote a book about somebody going blind and that is very visceral. Uh, but more recently, I mean, just now, I published a book about blind, an essay about blindness and vision and sort of go back to the blind writers, Borges, of course, Joyce, and so many others, but also the invisibility of women in that regard. But I also spoke about the, um, the Chilean revolt. And I really thought very hard on like, should I describe the kind of damage that the militarized police produced in more than 300 Chilean eyes and even sort of the blinding, the full blinding of some of its citizens, right? And how do you escape from the actual propaganda that the state produces when it attacks it's uh, civilians, right? And so it, it took me a while to think about that. And, and it's a very poetic text that is sort of always sort of going around horror, but without sort of looking it in the eye, so to speak. It, trying not to sort of mimic the kind of horror that the police and the state wanted to produce, not only in those who were victims, but in the rest of the citizenry who were uh, due to go out and protest and continue to protest because the protest really lasted for a very, very long time. And it will come back after the pandemic is over, if it ever is, hopefully. So anyway, so, so the sort of the aesthetic question is a very hard question because it's also a political question. Uh, it's also trying not to play the game of horror that the state produces. And, that, and I think that Mariana, for example, as I just read, finished reading, actually audio reading um, her, her novel, um, oh wait, uh, Nuestra Parte de Noche, I don't know how that was translated. Uh, I think that she also works very nicely with sort of separating some sorts of horror from the propaganda of horror that the state would want to produce. Thank you, Lina, and thank you, Mariana. And what were you saying, Lina, just right now about the protest is, is very relevant to what is happening, for example, in Colombia. Yesterday, there were a lot of protests, and of course, the police also severed, and many people lost their eyes due to mm -hmm. this violence, right? Uh, and my next question, uh, I want to connect 
um, a little bit this talk with what is going on in the Department of Comparative Literature. And so next week, the department will host a conference organized by the graduate students, which is called Communities Imagined and Speculative Real. And some of the conferences central questions are what does community look like and how can we think community anew despite or in new of the concept persisting past and i know that your work has dealt with this issue uh, in in nuestra parte noche i also don't know how it has been translated uh, in that novel mariana that you have there are these members of the secret congregation called la orden Right? and are bound by blood ties, but also by an interest in the occult and the demonic in order to attain eternal life. And in your case, Lina, communities arise from and develop within the space created by epidemic tra transmission and sickness, for example, in viajes virales and, or, and also sistema nervioso, yeah. but also by a shared sense of identity in Volverse, Palestina. And my question then is whether the laws the dangers or even the longing for a community is a standing preoccupation in your literary imagination. And I also would like you to elaborate on how your books in general depict communities and the relationships inside them. Like what, what do you find interesting in them? I guess the, the, the book hasn't been translated yet, but since both of you mentioned it, it's, a, it's an Emily Dickinson verse, it's Our Share of Night. I think the, the correct translation is porción, but porción uh, instead of part, instead of parte, should be porción. But porción in, in, in Argentinian is very related to pizza. Like you ask for a porción <laughs> of pizza, and it's, it, it sounds absolutely stupid. So, so I, you know, I was a bit more free in the translation. But anyway. Um, that community, especially in the in that um, in that novel, it's uh, what I think I don't I can't remember, and this is shameful. But I can't remember from whom I heard this concept at first. But someone told me, or I read somewhere, that being rich is uh, being in a different country. Doesn't matter in, in where you're born, or you know. Or if you if you're rich, you have your own your own your own community, your own country, and that idea gave me um, the idea of uh, writing. That is, in, in a way, is a very um, uh, you know um, kind of trope. You know the, this this uh, kind of uh, occult uh, covenant of of people that you know work for a god, let's say, but work for themselves. But I was thinking a lot about um, rich people in my country, landowners in my country, the the people that held the power in, in my country, not only, but I was thinking specifically about them and how they control lives, how they control territory, how they control politics. Um, and how they would, if they could, live forever in this body. You know, it's a like a body horror kind of thing too, because mm -hmm. they're, what they're trying is trying to use, if they can't use their body, they would use other bodies. That is something that they actually do. Uh, they, they use bodies, you know, for their own profit, but this is like a very literal use of a trope that is invading bodies to continue their lives, um, which is something that if you think in other terms, they've been doing forever, using bodies to, keep on their their power and their relevance and you know the their control of the of the situation and also this uh, uh, maintaining this country the, the, the country of the rich the country of, of, of the powerful and um, I don't see them as a community though you know I think um, 
community is something else. And I don't know if I explore that much community in my, in, in my writing because um, I think what uh, neoliberalism in our countries or at least in my country did was destroy communities or destroy the, the idea that a community is something that you wish for like the kind of enormous propaganda about meritocracy, individualism, like these are, you know, these are the words of success. These are the good words. Communities, you know, for losers, <laughs> you know, mm. for, um, you know, for poor people. It's, it's very, what, they, what they've done to words, uh, and to concepts, it's very savage. So I don't think I, I you know, um, think that much about, about community, but maybe about the destruction of communities. Like uh, the, this story, I can't remember the card, I think it's translated. It's one of the, one of the, of the short story books. And it's about how, um, a low income, um, but middle class, not, not, not really poor uh, neighborhood, insults greatly a man that lives in the streets, a man that, you know, carries a cart with lots of things that he's carrying from what people are uh, throwing away. And he's drunk and stuff, so the, you know, he is attacked verbally. And he leaves because he's uh, scared, but he leaves the cart in the in the neighborhood because uh, you know he's scared and you know, he never picks it back. He never comes back for it. But I'm, what I was thinking was that was kind of uh, uh, you know that the the lack of solidarity, the lack of understanding, the lack of the lack of empathy. The lack of this is something I witnessed. This is something that I've seen. You know, this a drunk man with a cart coming in the neighborhood of my mother, and people just you know throwing him out like he was the plague. I thought, what this has to do to these people is kind of uh, uh, they have to be punished. <laughs> And the punishment came came in the in, in the it's a of course it's a it's a horror kind of fantastic uh, story, and the horror comes from that card. That card has kind of a you know is a is cursed, and the curse kind of expands in the neighborhood, and the curse is poverty. This card makes them poor because that's what they fear. So it's the destruction of a community that was already rotten. So in that sense, it's that I write about communities, but not in a nice sense, let's say, because what really worries me is how the very idea of community is constantly um, attacked. Yeah, I think I can, I can connect very closely uh, to Mariana's description of the neoliberal principles that I think we are all under. Um, I could sort of see what that means. And at the same time, I, I, I hope that I'm not too naive in my sort of some sort of optimism that that paradigm is somehow starting to, to fall apart. Because clearly, at least in Latin America, as you were saying, Santiago, uh, there's been a lot of protest in Ecuador, in Nicaragua, in Colombia, Argentina, Chile, you know, you name it. I'm, I'm probably missing half of it, Peru, uh, previously Bolivia, right? So there's, there's a sense of a crisis, right, that has to do with these uh, awful principles of the eye, right, the eye like this. Um, I wrote a novel that has to do with that principle. Uh, Seeing Red is 
a little bit as how a, 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 a woman turns into an individualist, right? Who wants absolutely to recover her vision. She's, she's lost her vision and wants to use, as Mariana was saying, the bodies of others uh, to heal, right? To, to, to recover her health, her vision. And of course, somebody criticized me uh, and uh, called me a, a bourgeois writer because uh, the critic was, you know, reading linearly uh, my my person and the character in the book for for good reasons because there's all kinds of tricks in the book, right? But I thought it was interesting because I was actually trying to represent what that looked like and how that became body horror, right? Um, uh, nervous System, which is the, 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 the newer novel, is actually a novel that thinks of that community. As, but it's a community because all of, all of the characters, even the, you know, the, 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 the toys that the kids play with are sick, right? And I wanted to think about what would happen if, if uh, sickness was the norm, which it, which it is, I, I believe it is. You know, we're always sort of in that strange negotiation in our bodies, but we're never safe, really. Now we know that. I think now we've been sort of trained into that, but we're never safe, right? That that makes us equal, even if there's people, of course, I was going to say, even if there's people with more money, of course, it's different because if you have more money, you can save yourself, right? You can find a cure for yourself. But in our bodies, without thinking of money, we are sort of some sort of equals. And I think that we, in that way, we are, we constitute a community. And I, and I like what Mariana said about the fact that in her novel, that, that, that family, which is really a family of very rich people who are using the bodies of others, are not really a community because there's no bond of affection. There's no shared, you know, vision of future. It's just about themselves as this family, but not even as a family, because they also get rid of those who rebel. And so, and so there's no community there. It's hard to find community of those in power, you know? I, I always think of the right wing in, in, in Latin America, there's no community. There's only the will to succeed and to earn more money. And I think that's why uh, the, the left wing in Latin America is always divided because they have values. So they're fighting for their values. And that's also a, a political problem sometimes. But it, at, at, in the values, there is a community. And I think that that's sort of interesting to think about, but I'm not a, poli a, a political science person, so I won't go in that direction. Um, your question, Santiago, was what does community look like today, right? And I don't know, but I, I am sort of, when I said that I don't, didn't want to be naive and it's utopian, I do think that there is a growing sense of community, at least in the, what I've seen in Chile, I'm right now in Chile actually. And what you see in Chile is a sense of like, there's an anger. It's not only communities of vulnerability, but there's also communities of anger. And there is this community of anger where, uh, suddenly the sort of the right, the, the, what I was saying, right wing and left wing, the divided left wing, I think that the anger of the people has created a sort of strange community of requests and desire of justice. And I'm finding that that community is very empowered. We don't know what's going to happen when the anger fades, right? But right now there is this feeling, right, of, of unity because we feel that we've been betrayed by power and by politicians. And I'm finding a strange sense of community there. I, I, this is not a very good answer, but it's the only one I can uh, give you. Uh, by the way, just a quick comment there. Um, there's one of the most important documentaries on ACT UP, uh, the organization that was fighting battling AIDS in the, at the end of the 80s. Mm -hmm. The title is United in Anger. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and that was their motto, actually. It was like this idea of precisely anger at this injustice and the, at the um, corporate greed, uh, government inaction. This led to an anger that was community making. No? It's, it's ang anger. Anger and love are political fuels. You have populism in love and anger, and it really moves people. I think that that's sort of the question of affect is sort of so central to politics. And that's the kind of community that I'm finding here. Not that we go out with friends when we can 
or talk with friends and we're only angry, of course, but there's a political energy around that. And it's interesting, I didn't think of this, uh, of this documentary. Thank you for mentioning that, Mariana. Okay, thank you. And I, now we are going to move to the questions from the public. And I think that there's an anonymous question that is really tied to what we are talking about. So I'm going to read it. And the question reads, uh, can you imagine the letter city occurring within digital spaces separated from a physical territory? Mm. What would this tell us about power and even about what Lena alludes to when she mentions the law? Now, this is what I, I really like about these uh, uh, get togethers, I'm going to call them uh, with uh, people who are trained readers and thinkers because the questions are difficult and they make you think. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I actually wrote about this when I wrote my book on AIDS and the last chapter is actually about Argentinian writers uh, in the post HIV, not the post HIV era, that doesn't exist. We're still in the HIV era. But in the in the post uh, triterapia, how do you say that in English? Um, post cocktail, post the post cocktail, yeah. The the the, the medication that saved lives uh, in the in the aid in the uh, in the community of people patients with AIDS. And the the many pieces that I found, the writing that I found, the novels uh, talked about a, a a digital the digital space as a community vis-a-vis -vis the fact of fear because there was fear of getting together and this i think has a lot of echoes to the the word the time we're living the community could only occur even the sexual relationships could only occur mediated by a screen and it was a sort of community but at the same time it was sort of triggered by fear uh so there was a sort of a, a desire of sort of of a community but at the same time a fear of being together. Uh, that said, and, and coming back to the question of the lettered city, I do think we've always had a lettered city that is mediated by a screen, a text. So it's just the soporte cambio, the, 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 the format, the technology. But you know, we're living in many technologies. So of course there is a lettered community in the digital space. The difference I think is that we've moved, and this is what I said earlier, we've moved from a lettered community that is representative of the principles of power and economy to a sort of community of letrados, more or less uh, uh, red, but that are confronting also power. So it's a, it's access to the letter to destroy the lettered city in the way that it's reproduced only one narrative of power that would sort of teach and teach others in, into the sort of the norms of privilege um, and be imposed on, uh, on others, right? So, so there is a community of letters, but it's not necessarily, and I'm sorry, I'm going around this question because it's a difficult question for me. But it's a sort of a community of people who are who who manage writing, who who have the letra that has been democratized, but at the same time it's confronting not always but many times confronting the notion of the the empowered letrado of the past. Does that make sense? I, I hope it does. Yes. Well, yeah. it's a difficult question, like she said, but maybe the only thing maybe I have to say about that is that there is um, first I'm thinking about the generational terms. Uh, and I'm finding I'm already 47. The, the things that many young, especially I teach journalism, narrative journalism, the spaces where some of my students are. Um, the people that they are listening to in YouTube, in a, you know, in a forums and, and stuff. Sometimes they strike me as a different power. I don't know if it's a littered power, but mm. I find quite amazing that the new rebel 
at least in Argentina, the new rebel is right wing, not the left wing. Hmm. The left wing is uh, old. Uh, it's, it doesn't work. This is what happening in Argentina now that it's in a very uh, kind of um, pessimistic uh, moment. We just came from a very neoliberal uh, government that failed, but the new government that is kind of center left started and the pandemic started. So there's, you know, there's no um, change of anything that would help the people. So people are, you know, more and more reactionary. Mm. I think there's a power in discourse that is uh, mostly digital there that I don't know if has a lot to do with the lettered city as we used to think about it, but it's certainly a new power. Mm. And, uh, and it's a new power in words and it's a new power in the young because maybe the old people don't, don't have this kind of, you know, ability to find this. And uh, I think this is kind of the first generation where I don't know, because I've never seen the people that, for example, if I had children, I don't have children, but if I had children or my students adore, I don't know their faces, I don't know who they are. I mean, they are like talking about, I don't know, Nati Peluso, and I'm, like, and I'm like, what? And I Google her and now she has like, I don't know, 40 million followers. So there, you know, there's something there that is kind of, it doesn't, uh, I, I, I don't find it scary, but I do see that there's, you know, a division there. And mm -hmm. every division, especially a massive generational and ideological also, division like that has to create different forms of power. So that's what I have to say about it. Today I had like a, you know, like a meeting with students and I had several, you know, interactions that were like, oh my God, you are like so out of it. And, <laughs> and that's kind of, um, you know, that, that you, you, you realize that, you know, the things have really changed and this has to have also political implications in the near future. Mm. It's interesting because I, I do think that I, I was speaking of the sort of the, the, the people that I encounter online, right, in those communities. And uh, you're probably super right that, uh, Mariana, that, you know, there's many communities there and they're very different. And it's, so they're also very locally specific, even if they're online, right? Um, so there are sort of local configurations and, and a multiplicity that sort of simultaneously um, uh, operate, right? So I am seeing sort of the growth of feminism, for example, on mm. online in that conversation. And I have this impression that everybody is reading more than ever, even than when I was growing up, right? But it's also I know that this is also very influenced by the kind of people that I see online. Um, I also don't have children. That's the only minus, I think, for me of not having <laughs> children, that you don't really know what's going on in the very, very young generations. I shouldn't say this, but I, I did. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot of compartmentation. This is the thing that you Absolutely. can, like, for example, in, I, I don't know, in, the, in your timeline in Twitter, you can choose who's there. So you can only read the people that you agree with or the things that you like or, or whatever. And then there's this yeah. whole world yeah. that is going on there. And then for example, people, I don't know, they win an election and, and you're like, how did that happen? Yeah. How yes. did that happen? Yeah. And this is happening everywhere. Yes. I was talking to uh, like um, people in Brazil, for example, that was a couple of years ago. And I was like, how did you let? <laughs> I know it's not their fault, but this was like a, you know, after dinner drunk conversation was how did you let this man rule your country? Because to us in, in you know, in, in Latin America, Brazil is also the land of freedom in a way, you know, the land of music, the land of, you know, of course, there's a lot of problems there, but it's like a space of 
uh, a special kind of freedom that has to be do with sexuality and it's not a stereotype it's really it's or, or it is but it's a nice stereotype it was and to make that you know kind of this kind of ugly place and they were like we didn't know him and we said how you didn't know him we knew him but of course we knew him he was so uh, you know he was in Congress, but we didn't know that he was raising this power to this point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think this is not only happens in the world of atoms, let's say. This is like, we really should stop thinking about digital and analogical and think that this is all reality. Mm -hmm. But what happens now is that this is a lot of compartmentation and this, what happens is the lots of realities that we just don't see. And this is a kind of uh, something not to be scared of, but something to understand that yeah. I don't know if we have a life to understand it, but it's something to, you know, think about more because sometimes I think one of the problems or the defects of politics and activism, especially from the left, is to dismiss this, uh, like the, the digital world for yeah. prejudice for you know yeah. many things yeah. and trust too much in the interaction in the bodies in you know the action in the street and stuff and thinking that this is some kind of non-real thing and this is not like that anymore yes i was reminded when i was speaking uh, of well gabriel george he uh, was a professor here at nyu mm -hmm. he has a whole research devoted to what he calls this um discourse of hate mm -hmm. that has its place precisely in this type of kind of invisible spaces which are for instance the comment sections in the newspapers the digital oh, yeah. comment sections that you know sometimes when you are masochistic like me you pay attention to that and, and you see what's <laughs> going on there and it's usually like really uh right-wing authoritarian hateful speech like uh but there's, as, as you were saying, it's kind of invisible because it's, you know, it's there's the newspaper story and then you have the comment section, maybe you didn't see it, but if you go yeah. there, it's very lively, it's full of people, people commenting, people responding to each other, and it's very much monopolized by the, by the extreme right, I would say, yeah. at least in Argentina and Brazil, which are the, the newspapers yeah. I read. And sometimes it's like dismissed as their trolls. Some of them are, many of them are, and some are paid trolls, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not all of them. But to think that all of them are trolls, it's, uh, it's our problem. If we think, I mean, if we, uh, we think about, I think uh, uh, about myself or something that cares about politics and that leans left, even with all the problems of the left. But this is one of the main problems, like uh, not paying attention to this and letting these mm -hmm. things slip. But it's like interesting, it's, I think, in connection to something both of you somehow brought because you were, well, we're just saying, like discussing with your students and like, this idea that you are, you are out of it. You are, you are, you know, you don't know who Nati Peluso is or whatever. Like that was just an example. And Lina was saying like, <laughs> she was referring to literature's slower rhythm, right? It's like literature, it's like, well, it's like in Hegel's image of the all of Minerva, right? It arrives later to the scene, after the fact, after the things have been happened and have it somehow digested. Whereas these other forms of writing that we are talking about right now are immediate at the mm -hmm. moment, just like the letters you mentioned, Lina covering Santiago, those coming mostly from the left, right? But this is, I think it's an interesting contrast so how to think literature vis-a-vis -vis these other forms of writing that, writing that are much more immediate, that are, you know, knowing what's going on right now, and, and why do we still, and I think we have to uh, still stick to literature, but why would there be a reason to do that if we can uh, address that? But, but I think, uh, Mariano, that we all live in, in diverse temporalities and spaces now. And so I, I, I sort of, I'm very fearful of the kind of discourse that thinks that we all need to live in the same temporality and it has to be fast, right? That's a very neoliberal concept mm -hmm. that everything has to be fast. And if you're not sort of in that rhythm and that in that track, you're out. I just said it, right? I don't have children, so I'm out. 
but but <laughs> I mean, but but I'm not worried about that actually. Not too worried. But the idea was that not having children was being cool. <laughs> well, I no, I don't know. It depends, right? But I mean, I, I don't follow you know yeah, that yeah. sort of energy. But but sort of but, but I'm just making a joke to myself. But but the the question of temporalities, I do think that we live in different. We all live in even in our daily lives in sort of different rhythms, and so there's a a time of quiet where we look maybe for an essay or for a poem or for a novel, and then and then five minutes later we're on Instagram and we're sort of living on this sort of the the, the fast and the slow. I don't see that as necessarily uh, an exclusion or for example, feeling, let's say Chilean, but at the same time having friends everywhere and thinking about what's going on in Palestine and Colombia and Argentina and Brazil at the same time. And I think that's something that going back to the original question that the anonymous person made, <laughs> um, that's something that we have been sort of put up to because of the digital space, right? Where we have sort of the sense of simultaneity and at the same time, a really sort of detachment of the time of the others. I'm, I'm not against that actually. I, I think that we're just sort of in a different, we're living differently. I mean, I, when I remember, I'm 50 years old and when I remember being 10 and spending my vacation two, two months in the you know seaside in the little house, blah, 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 no phone, no nothing, only books. That was a very different time. Now I feel I'm living in different times, uh, in different velocities, uh, actually, and trying actually not to be in such an accelerated velocity because there's no time to think and reflect, which mm -hmm. is, I think, what, what writers and scholars do, and we find pleasure in that, at least. I, I do, at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, we have another question from Isabel Babun. Isabel, if you're there, would you like to make the question yourself? I think that I can unmute you. I guess <laughs> maybe Isabel is not there, but I can I, I can make it. So, it's her, but uh, we have to unmute her. I already unmute her. I I think. Oh hi, hello everyone. Oh <laughs> hi, Hola. I'm here. <laughs> hello Mariana. Hello Lina. Um, so I was I was thinking about performance as a figure of representation about all this violence that we had here in Chile in 2019. And I was thinking maybe from the theater actually, performance from there, how literature can do also um, make maybe an intervention from the letter, you know, from the writing. Uh, and, and try to rethink literature, not from, from the page, from actually the body. I don't know if that is, is a confusing, but I'm trying also to think how we can reflect about the act of writing without actually writing, how, how writing can be, um, can be full of body uh, and, and trying to make maybe, um, rethink the act of writing, as I said, from all this violence that we have here. And actually the city is, is an actual stage from, from tonight, 2019 and before actually. So I, I guess that's the question. I don't know if, if it is understandable or, or not. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to start Mariana or do I go ahead? No, no, you do because uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's I'm more, thinking- more, It's I'm, more I'm, intense there. Yeah, well, I think that there's, I mean, performance, I tend to think of theater, right? Because I'm an, I am an old person and I like theater. But uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the city is, has been a stage lately for uh, political discourse and political also happening and, and, and song and dance. And I, what comes to mind immediately is the performance of Las Tesis right? This uh, colectiva, this collective, uh, it's, it's, I think it's three women, maybe four, I can't remember now, uh, who produced this song that interestingly was taking on Rita Segato's writing, the anthropologist, right? So it's interesting how they take upon the, the thinking and the concepts of violence and rape, right, uh, against women from an anthropologist. So a sort of a person who writes on the page, right, 
uh, and who takes her time to 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 think, right, and to and to study, right, to to uh, to do her interviews uh, in the in the communities in prison, for example, and uh, amongst men, right, and they turn this into a lyric which they perform on the streets and actually become so successful thanks to the digital spaces, right, and this. And this is reproduced, right, by other women in other places, even by changing the script sometimes and also mm -hmm. changing the language. And so I think that there is a sort of an interesting connection there where we see that the body is put a center stage, right, but, at the, but the, the ideas are still, still circulating from different spaces. So when I was talking about different temporalities, I also think that there's different areas spaces right where the letter is not only in the book it's also existing and reverberating in other uh, spaces and this is just sort of the example that comes to mind but of course in performance we are using the language in a I want to think in a in a manner that is uh, politically engaged uh, sometimes um, sort of in a, in, in a, what I would consider a good way, right? Trying to bring the good values of community. And as Mariana and Mariana were commenting, sometimes in, 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 in bad ways, right? In sort of in, in politically xenophobic, racist, um, homophobic, et cetera, ways, right? Uh, but there, the body, is, the, the thing is the body is not disconnected from language. We produce language mm. because we are bodies. Right, our minds are parts of our body. So I, I see a some sort of continuum uh, between the body and the the word. Even if it's a written word, it's coming from somebody who is using its body to write. In the case of Buenos Aires, not just Buenos Aires, but I think uh, all the major cities in Argentina in the last years. The thing with the uh, with the uh, protest and the streets and you know performance in protest in Argentina is that it's been going on forever, hmm. and uh, and it's not mostly it's not repressed, or when it is, it was in the in the in the last neoliberal government we had it wasn't really violent though uh, only a couple of times maybe but it's very um rejected by the if you if you want to think about the, the you know the the citizens of the country as a community the the reaction of the citizens of the country as a community when a mobilization is repressed is very strong like people don't tolerate it they don't even tolerate now. The, the, the now right now, there's many protests against uh, you know sanitary measures and things like that. Like people, um, there's there's people that strongly react against them, and people who are you know supporting the the lockdowns and stuff. Um, even those people that support the lockdowns and stuff, maybe they're complaining in Twitter or some other public kind of social media, like, oh, they should, you know, they should stop them, whatever. But when and if police stop them, it would be a scandal. So it doesn't happen. Mm. But I think that the last, um, every uh, different, uh, uh, you know, unions protest in a certain way and they have the choreography. All people, like people that, you know, ask for their pensions, have their own choreography, like really. And um, it's very intense. But the last one that was very, very intense was uh, Ni Una Menos. That was um, a mobilization that started with, uh, you know, Ni Una Menos means not one less. That means it was at, at first a very massive um, protest against femicide. There was like a rise of femicides and very uh, public uh, femicides. Like when I say public, it was like, the, I don't know, the wife of a famous person, like sometimes things like that, that you really stroke the people in unexpected ways. And this was like, 
massive, absolutely massive women, not men allowed in the streets, uh, women in, in, you know, in violet, in, it's like f feminism color, things like that. And very quickly, that movement that was massive, massive, like, uh, I don't know, 100,000 people, maybe more in the streets, quickly took something that seemed very far for the women's movement at that time, I'm talking about, I don't know, eight years ago or something, there was an abortion law uh, or legal interruption of pregnancy, that's how it's called. And uh, quickly, I think the second, it was like one, one a year or something like that. The second one was, of course, it was about femicide, but it was like, uh, we need this, we need this law. This is a law that as women, we need, we deserve, and we've been talking about this forever. And there were teenagers in this movement. And they were like the old women that were fighting for this. And it was absolutely massive. And it was very choreographic also uh, in the way that, uh, you know, that the way the women were dressed, the women, how they were using the makeup, the, you know, the green, uh, the, 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 you could only all, all dressed in green or use the green pañuelo. I don't know how you say it in, in in uh, in English, but handkerchief. The handkerchief, eh? handkerchief, yeah. Yes, but it's not the handkerchief. It's like no, it's a, not. Mm. It's kind of a you know, it's a it's a piece of cloth that you wrap. Mm. Um, and there was, of course, a lot of um, I don't know uh, paintings, and you, you know, it was a, an absolute movement that has had it, its own aesthetic, its own sounds, let's say, its own music and a massive political power. I think it was the last time I saw uh, political power in action in the streets mm. in that way. And we had the abortion law last year in the middle of the pandemic when everybody was thinking like, this is absolutely impossible. And there were women there, there were not many, of course. Um, they were trying to keep some, you know, social distance or, or, or whatever, but it was not really, what was amazing is was that it was not really needed. It was done. All those years doing that and being, you know, a presence in the street that was so, um, death, it was kind of scary. I remember being in one, it was kind of scary. There was like, for example, I don't know, call, we call, call the columns of people. This was a column of, you know, young trans and lesbian women and they were all together and they were like protecting themselves from people that could, you know, be disruptive with this massive uh, uh, wooden, like, uh, you know, things to, to, to keep them in line, to keep, they were, they, they were protecting themselves. And uh, I wanted to cross and I, I went down the, you know, the barrier and they were not mean, but it was like, this is not your place. And it was also an, an understanding of, you know, within women and within the, the women's movement and within feminism, how different we were and, you know, it's, um, and how it was important from, for them to feel protected in the street because they suffered a lot of harassment in the street. I don't know. I, would, I think that's what I'm trying to say was that it was very powerful, it was very special, it was very choreographic and it had results. And when it had results, it wasn't spectacular. It had results because it was kind of meant to have results. That's something that, you know, there was that organic could not have um, a different outcome, I think. Uh, and now what's amazing is that, you know, the legal interruption of a pregnancy is going on and it's happening and nobody cares. And so it's kind of, so normal that it's like, why it took that? 
Well, sometimes it takes that. And um, and I, I, I don't know if without the, you know, that what I said, without that very, like visually striking, you can Google it and it's pretty amazing. Uh, without that, it would have been possible. Yes. Thanks uh, to both of you. It's how the, the last bit of what you said, Mariana, sounds like what uh, Naomi Klein has to say always that in certain parts of Earth, and maybe in all of them now, without this intensity of protest, we don't have citizenship, we don't have democracy, we don't have basic laws. You know, it's like, uh, like more and more, we kind of need these choreographies and this performative state of citizenship in the streets in order mm -hmm. to have this basic rights. Well, thanks a lot to both of you. Honestly, it's been a pleasure and honor. And thanks also to Santiago, to Ivan and to Michael that in the middle of the strike as are, are doing this. Uh, again, thanks to everybody who's been here. And well, to the grad students, good luck in this fight. I hope you will win it, okay? Mm -hmm. So bye, thanks a lot. Yes, well, you thank you, I'm... thank you for, for, for asking us to do this. And yeah, good luck with the strike. Yeah, same same thing here. Very good luck and thank you so so much for this very substantial uh conversation. Thank you. Bye.